All right, let's get started. Um, let me get the sign-in sheet passed around um, before we get started. We're, we're going to really talk about uh, two big things today. I want to go through the lab testing data one more time, and I want to talk about um, or get into our final topic of the semester, which is asphalt. Okay. Now, before we get into that, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about housekeeping and a little bit about scheduling. Okay. And I've got an idea, and, and I, I want to run it by you, and I want to see what you think. Um, it's not set in stone or set in concrete, no pun intended, but um, I, you all miss the puns, right? I know Thanksgiving break. Although the not Michelson account, you got plenty of, of, of puns. Okay, the statics and statistics one I thought was pretty good. The one with SpongeBob, that was pretty good. All right. All right. Um, I want to run something by you, and I want to see what you think. So um, that, that jerk of a structural analysis professor has his exam right next to this one. Okay? And so there's a lot of folks that have exams, they have three exams in a row. Now, whenever students have three exams in a row, or three exams on the same day, and they make a request they need to, they want to move one of their exams, we've got to figure it out. I have an idea, and I want to run it by you, I want to see what you think. Okay, so here's my idea. I'm not going to be here next week, okay? I'm going to be at a, a, a conference, so I'm not going to be here at all. Now, it works out very well for uh, uh, our topics because we really only have one topic left to discuss, and that's asphalt. Today we'll talk about binders. Uh, Thursday we'll talk about asphalt concrete, and then we are done with civil engineering materials, okay? But we've still got some work ahead of us, okay? I want to run something by you, and I want to see what you think, okay? So. Today, you, um, we're talking about asphalt binders, and I have assigned homework seven, okay, which is uh, your homework on timber and asphalt. So I guess your final homework, we'll call your final homework homework eight, the homework eight being the big concrete report. Okay, let's talk a little bit about scheduling. So right now, your homework six is due um, on the 30th, okay? That's, that's not changing. That, that uh, Maybe I ought to bold that or something because that, that's going to be when that's due, okay? <coughs> so we will we'll sort of lock that in, okay? Now right now I have your final homework due on the 5th, okay? Um, and that's going to be locked in and what I, what I sort of want to talk about is, is homework 7 and a potential about the exam. Now obviously your exam is scheduled for Tuesday the, um, the, the 12th, but what I'm curious about is if you all are interested in potentially doing the exam during dead week. Yes. <laughs> the recording picked that one up. I'm not. You're not. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's the deal. All right, let's do a show of hands. How many of you want to do the exam during lab next Thursday? Raise your hand. How many say no? I know. I, I can get somebody to proctor it. That, that's easy. That's easy. I've, I've already asked Patrick if he's willing to proctor it. He said yes. So, so he's fine with that. Okay, <clears throat> now, okay, we got, we got a couple issues with that, and I want to make sure everybody's okay with this. Okay, number one, all right, when it comes to the homework assignments, I, I'm going to keep the homework assignment deadlines pretty hard and fast, okay? So, on homework six, it's due Thursday uh, in class. I'm going to turn the solution on, on Blackboard, right then. So I can't accept late assignments is what I'm getting at, okay? Now, my big issue is this homework seven, the one I assigned today, okay? The, the problem is I don't want, uh, and it's really sort of up to you, homework seven is due next Thursday, but that material is on the exam. So what I'd like to do, if you, it's not a very long assignment, it's pretty short. What I'd like to do is have you submit that on Tuesday. Then I will turn the solution on on Blackboard so that you will have it to study for the exam on Thursday. What do you think? We'll do that if you change the final homework to Thursday and give us two extra days of notice. 
I'm easy to get along with that. We can do that. That's fine. No, that's fine because I said that, that doesn't actually really matter. That doesn't really matter. I'm fine with that. So, no, nah, uh. -uh. So hold hold off on Instagramming for now. What do you think? No, like like right. I, is this what we're all agreeing on? I'm fine to get. I'm easy to get along with. But once we agree to it, it it's you know. Setting and hardening as, as, as <laughs> Vicat penetration is, is, has, has crossed the 25 millimeter mark. <laughs> so I get, this is an assigned day. That's not really a due date. So my OCD is going to get me. Okay. All right. So are we, are we clear on this? So work six, your steel and aluminum assignment will be due on two days from now, and then for each of these uh, homework assignments, the moment they're, they're due, it will, the solution will turn on, okay? So homework uh, number uh, six is due on uh, Thursday, homework seven the following Tuesday, and the day of the exam, you turn in your final lab report. It'll be at two o'clock in lab. Okay, now that, that there's, there's one little caveat, one little thing we might need to figure out, um, and that's exam review. That one's a little iffy, okay? So I propose the following solution for exam review, okay? I want to give you all an option to have to ask questions about the exam, okay? We do have lab on Thursday, okay? So why don't we do this? We lecture on Thursday, we meet for lab, and it's just exam review. You can come or not, you know, you know come if you want. Um, and we'll discuss the exam. Okay, is that fair? That that's fair. So that way, that way we have an exam three review session. Um, we've covered all the material. You've had a chance to ask questions. And on Tuesday, when you turn in your your homework number seven, you'll probably just stack it on the cart. I'll get somebody to grab it, give it to the TA, um, and then I'll have somebody uh, proctor your exam the the following Thursday. What do you think? Well, I got two questions, you, you and you. Um, the homework due Tuesday, is it going to be at 12.30? Yes, because I'm turning the solution on on Blackboard. Okay, and then the final homework, will we print out that entire lab report? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, and, and uh, my initial answer is no. I think what I'm going to have you all do is I'm going to create groups on Blackboard and then you all can submit it as one big PDF. We can talk about that next Thursday, though, because we got time. So I got I got because I'll have to create groups and assign each of the group members, the users, and then we'll figure that out. So now your question. Okay. All right. All right. Yes. Okay. So this is the final exam is December seventh. December seventh at two o'clock. In fact, here. Why don't I? Why don't I do one thing? Okay. So we'll say um, this is what we'll do. Okay, watch this. So we'll do exam three review. And this is exam three, since it's in lab, we'll say at 2 p.m., right? We'll display that and then we'll Instagram post. Wow. Okay, all right. <laughs> Everybody okay with this? We all in agreement. I will send out an email uh, summarizing all this at some point. I promise I will. Okay. One other thing. Okay. And I mentioned this in structural analysis. I'll mention this in here. Okay. So course eval time has come up. Okay. Um, I what I will do is this for for course eval. Um, I want to see you do them. You can say I'm the worst professor ever. You can say I'm the best professor ever. Say whatever you want, but I want to see you do them, and I want to see you uh, take them seriously. I, I take them seriously. I told uh, uh, structural analysis this uh, story. I'll tell you all as well. Um, my first semester here, I was using these PowerPoint slides 
uh, that had really dark backgrounds. So when I printed them off and students were writing on them, they couldn't write. So I got a comment in my course evals and they said, can you, can you change the background on your slides because we can't write on them? That's a good point. So you can see the theme that I use. Give me one sec. Point I'm getting at is that I, I listen to this stuff. Okay. So this is what I want you to do. All right. Uh, if you do your course eval, I'm not making you do it. If you do it, okay, do a screen capture that showed me that you completed it. I don't want to see what you said. Uh, that's confidential. I just want to see that you did it. And if you go on the Blackboard, there's an assignment on Blackboard, and you upload just that screen capture. I'll give you 10 bonus homework points. So if this semester there's a total of 300, 350, whatever, homework points, I'll add 10 on top of that. So if you've done really, really well on your homework assignments, can you get over 100% on your homework average? Yes, you can. Okay. So I'm sure you all will do the math, but I'll tell you, it, it, it pretty much rounds out to about one more point in the class. So if you have an 86 and you do that, you get an 87. So that's it's about what it comes out to. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it's it's just the screen capture. It's a, it's confidential. No, no, <laughs> no, please don't. I don't want no, no. I I really do respect that process. <coughs> Moving on, one thing I'll mention, so I, I, I did a poll, um, let me say this, this is kind of important, this is kind of, uh, 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 this is kind of important, so um, I can log on to, to MyMU and as a faculty, the only thing that I know is how many people did the survey, that's all they, they tell us uh, at this point, so I know there's 32 people in the class and I know nine of you have done it, but as of now only five of you have actually uploaded uh, the image, the screen capture. So there's four of you that did the survey and I don't know that you did it. So if my point is, if you don't show me that you did the survey, I'm not going to know to give you free points. You, you see what I'm saying? So upload the, the picture and you'll get free points. Sound good? No, no, no. On Blackboard, there is, a, there is an assignment. Just literally screen capture it. You, uh, some folks have put it in a Word document and just uploaded the Word document. And all I want to see is your completed survey list to show that you did it. The same thing is set up on structural analysis. So if you're in both classes, do it twice or I'm, I'm really not going to be able to keep track of it. So, Sound good? All right. Um, okay. L let's really briefly talk about the final lab because we've got time and I do want to mention that. So um, group number one. Let's see, I noticed, we noticed a typo in your beam length at the end. This is 6.031. What was it again? Was it 20? 20.031. Okay. So that was highlighted on the, the beam data, so that's 20.031. I had a few, couple students ask me about that. Um, at this point, if you have not yet started lab report, like, like start your lab report. Uh, <laughs> My que uh, reason I'm bringing this up is, uh, first off, were there any other data mistakes or errors or whatnot that you noticed? As far as I know, is everybody's data right? I'm talking about your, you, you are, if you're in group two, you don't know if group three's numbers are right. You can tell if your numbers are right. So does, did anybody find any errors? Okay. All right. My second question is, since we're here and since we've got time, let's talk about it. Does anybody have any questions? about their final report. Yes. Okay, so in like section 3.2, you're looking for a district for every group. Mm -hmm. In the example page, when you have grade type, we don't have to do that. That's, that's fine. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. I want to see that you've collected your own, but I, I, I'm not really worried about that. Okay. Yes. So, so, Throughout our testing, we're determining, okay, so, so there's really two different types of properties that we've been determining, fresh mix properties and hardened properties. So what fresh mix properties have we determined? Somebody tell me. Temperature, slump, air, flow, flow ring, or J flow, uh, J ring flow test, um, and then hardened properties. So what are some hardened properties that we've determined? Compressive strength, flexural, uh, or, flexural or, or modulus of rupture, and there's another one. 
It's the, I, I know you did it. The unit weight. The weight divided by the volume. You did do that, right? <laughs> I hope you did. It's in, it's in the, uh, the, um, it's on the data sheet. So, like, I, I mean, I'll go ahead and show, I mean, I have a, a, a data sheet that is, um, that, that has all these already computed. Do you like that? And that, that, that one student who, or I'm sure there's a couple students who didn't make it today. I just, that was the answer. It was there. The answer to the lab we were working on the whole semester, it's there. Did you like that? Ah, uh, too much of a good thing. <coughs> Any other big ticket questions about the, uh, about the lab report? Yes. Yes, yes. Just find your most represent, like you know, one set that has all the contained data, and just use that. Don't don't put every individual group member's data sheets, or you'll have what five or six repetitions. So don't do that. And you can if you want. You're just going to take that 50, 60 page report and turn it into a hundred page report. So. But that, that's killing trees. But, but see, this is a report on concrete, not timber. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, it's it's not a hard and fast number. That's really more of a, a, a an idea to give you. It's it's more a guide to give you an idea of how long something should be. Like, um, uh, you know, if you're writing your section on the slump test, you know, we filled it up and lifted it. But you see what I mean? Like, I mean that that's what you did. I, I understand that's what you did, but but a little more description would be nice. It, it's a guide. Um, I know that that uh, some of you are going to be a little more verbose, and some of you are going to be a little more succinct. But it's, it's more to try and give you uh, a, a goal for how to technically describe what you've done in the lab and how to refer back to specifications and so on and so forth. Another point I will mention, bounce this stuff back and forth between your group. Um, you know, if you write a section, give it to another group member to review, you know. I, just think of this as a dry run for next year. So, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's going to get a little bigger and more intense next year, so. Some of you who are in senior design. What's that? Oh, oh, yeah. Ignore the wet and dry curing conditions. I think next year I am going to do that. No, no. In all seriousness, and uh, next year I think I'm going to uh, our concrete mixes are going to have larger yields. I'm going to shoot for 12 cylinders instead of nine, and then I'm going to cure half of them in the back, and half of them. In, in air, and then we'll test both, and then we'll see the difference between wet and dry curing conditions. Uh, we work. I was going to do it this year, but I decided not to. And then I also think I'm going to have each group have a unique water cement ratio. So, you know, let's say group one is basically ha has a slushy from 7-Eleven, <laughs> and group six has a slump of about a sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> and then, not, I don't know if it's going to be that bad, but, but I am going to vary that up a little bit. So it'll create some variability in the data. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so when you say you use ASTE format for the references? Um, I'm going to be pretty loose on that. Uh, just use a consistent referencing. Um, uh, <laughs> the idea was to, um, I guess, expose you all a little bit to like how ASCE papers and whatnot format references. I think instead I'm just going to wait till you all get to senior design. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So. That's fine because um, 
you can discuss that as, like when you summarize your data and then discuss potential sources of error. That's basically it in a nutshell. Because let, let me put it like this: this experiment is more about characterizing a material's behavior and a material's fundamental properties. It's not like we're testing a theory. You see what I mean? It, it's not like we're well we're, we're testing to see whether or not concrete works. Like we know it works. So it's it's really more about you know our experiment was to determine these properties, and in those sections you're summarizing them. Not really a whole much, a whole lot to conclude. So I'm not really. That's why I didn't really worry about it. That's a good question, though. Yes. Um, that's a good question. Uh, my prediction is because we guessed on. It's not so much that we guessed, but the the water content or the moisture content of the sand was not right. If you remember, um, remember how we were drying out the sand right before the lab? I think some water got in that bin, so the, 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 the sand was, was kind of soggy. When we started weighing out, when we started scooping out your sand, because that the top layer of that sand was as dry as it could be, but when we started scooping it out, and, and I'm like, this is sand castle quality right here. I was like, oh no. I looked at it and I'm like, this is going to be a soggy mess. And it kind of was. <laughs> that, would, that, would, that would be my guess. Um, another, uh, I don't know, I don't know if, I, if this is a source of error, but there is one quantity that in the process of determining that mix design was totally guessed, or guessed that we just you know, took a, a wild stab at, and that was the specific gravity of the sand. We didn't do that, you know, in, in lab. Because that's, that experiment's a little touchy, and you have to sit there and basically stare at it for like four hours until, until it gets right. So we just, I think, if I remember correctly, I guessed like 2.5. But next year, we might, like Patrick and I might actually do that, that, that experiment. But we, we didn't do that this year. We just picked a number and went with it. So that those are two potential sources of error and but those are those are global sources of error in other words that's for everybody um, there are also local sources of error in other words things that you might have done differently like spilling cement or you know um, uh, you know not properly consolidating the cylinder just tap it in tap 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 a roof right so, but that, that, you need to identify that within your own group, so. <coughs> Any other questions? So, we'll revisit this on Thursday. I highly advise that you um, go back and investigate that a little further. Um, before we get into asphalt, let me ask one final question. Did that resolve the final exam issue with structural analysis. Is it talk about moving that exam? I think that would solve everybody's problem in here. Um, I guess the only thing to mention is uh, we'll have to bring that up in structural analysis. There might be some students who aren't in here who still have three exams that day. So we'll figure something out. So. Sound good? All right. Let's talk about asphalt. Okay. All right, so we're really going to split our discussion of asphalt up into um, into two two parts. Uh, part one is what we're going to talk about today, which is essentially the, the the binder. Okay, so I mean, how many of you have either you know worked on pavement jobs or, or you know been on a DOH site where you've seen uh, roads being paved, et cetera, et cetera? How many of you have any uh, experience? With that? Okay, all right, good. Okay, so. The, my first sort of my first portion of this lecture is going to be talking about the binder. That's what we're talking about today. So the 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 you know we're talking about the black tar-like substance that is actually binding uh, the asphalt together. What we'll talk about on Thursday is a little bit of a general overview on how to uh, on how uh, asphalt pavements or asphalt concrete is proportioned. And we are not going to go into as significant a level of detail as we did with Portland cement concrete. I mean, to do asphalt pavement right, I mean, there are 
courses in just pavement design or flexible pavement design. That's a topic in and of itself. Um, and we really don't have time, nor do, do uh, most civil engineering materials courses have time to dig into that in, in very significant detail. So if you're interested in pavement uh, or, or, or that area, I would say go into transportation or maybe take a pavement design class. Um, I know we have a, a graduate level pavement design class here at Marshall, but um, I'm not sure when it's being offered next, but just be on the lookout. Um, <coughs> So some general facts uh, about asphalt is predominantly used in pavement construction, as I'm sure uh, you all are, are, are very aware of. Um, it's used in sealing and, and waterproofing. That is one very fundamental property of asphalt binders is that asphalt is waterproof. So that's something to, to keep in the back of your head. Um, <coughs> now, asphalt uh, is basically a uh, product. Uh, it's a petroleum uh, byproduct. So you're basically taking a crude petroleum and you're distilling it to get various uh, uh, products uh, that we use. I mean, you use crude petroleum and you distill it and you get gasoline, you get kerosene, you get diesel. Asphalt, or the binders, that's, that's basically uh, uh, where this is coming from. Now, in terms of asphalt, the actual material, the, 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 the tar-like substance, if you will, there are really three types. So nudge, nudge, wink, wink, what are the three types of asphalt that we use in, in civil engineering? Oh, now everybody's like, oh, let's get the notebook out, get the pen out, we gotta write this down. It's like we might be celebrating this at some point. Um, <coughs> so the first type is, is asphalt cement, the binder. Okay? And, and the difference between asphalt cement and something like an asphalt emulsion or an asphalt cutback is, is their, their, uh, their uses. So asphalt cement or binder is primarily used in hot mix asphalt, in, in hot applications. Cut back and emulsions are used in cold mixes. They're, they're mostly used for maintenance, for, for patching, you know, you know uh, applications like that. That's usually where uh, cut back and emulsions are used. Uh, but binder and asphalt cement, that, that's obviously the, the most common. Um, a little bit about uh, asphalt cement uh, and the binder. Um, so, uh, uh, asphalt is a material that is viscoelastic, okay? So, you obviously know what uh, the term elastic means, right? It means that, you know, it, if you load it and you let it go, it goes back to its uh, original condition, right? Uh, at cold temperatures, or at low temperatures, asphalt is an elastic material. It, it, it's solid. But what happens when you heat asphalt up? It gets soupy and it turns into a liquid. Um, at high temperatures, asphalt is, is a viscous, it's a fluid uh, type material. So if you hear the term viscoelastic, you're essentially referring to a material that either has different uh, mechanical properties um, uh, at different temperatures or as a function of time. So that, that's really sort of the, 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 the definition of that word. So. Um, <coughs> Couple other properties about a uh, binder, about asphalt cement. It does uh, adhere well to most aggregate, which makes it a really nice uh, uh, product for pavement applications. Like I said, uh, it is uh, waterproof, but obviously, and I, I think this is probably um, not too uh, big of a surprise for those of you that have been involved in DOH projects where uh, paving has been uh, applied. When asphalt pavement is put down, it's pretty hot, right? Asphalt is a material that, uh, that properties are very dependent on its temperature, okay? Now, <coughs> um, cutbacks and, and emulsions are um, basically, they're, they're, they're very similar, okay? So like I said, there's three types of uh, uh, asphalt products. There's a binder, there's cutbacks and emulsions. Cutbacks and emulsions are, are very, very similar. Essentially what's happening with a cutback or, or an emulsion is you're taking that binder and you're dissolving it in, in some type of solvent. So it's a little bit of uh, asphalt and a little bit of uh, a solution. Um, the, the, the benefit of using a cutback or an emulsion type product is that uh, you can use it at, at room temperature. So you don't need that uh, additional heat applied uh, for applications. Now, essentially what happens is you take that, that emulsion or that cutback and you're spraying it on the aggregate and, and uh, what happens is the solvent will, will tend to evaporate and leave the, ag or the asphalt behind that binds with the aggregate and there you go, you've got a, an application for maintenance, uh, maintenance and patching. So you, the benefit of that is you do get to uh, use it in uh, 
in cold mix maintenance applications or patching if you're trying to seal a crack or, or uh, seal a chip or you know for base or, or stabilization of sub base something like that it works really well uh, in those applications it can be a little dangerous because those solvents can be flammable and, and I mean environmentally it's not the friendliest uh, 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 product because those solvents evaporate so you're releasing a lot of hydrocarbons and whatnot into the environment so environmentally not the greatest uh, 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 application these cutbacks and emulsions um, but you know there is that um, emulsions uh, the, the big difference between an emulsion and a cutback is you, you essentially are mixing more into water than you are into a, a, a hydrocarbon solvent. So it's a little safer and a little friendlier uh, on the environment. They, they tend to be a little more common now. Basically, your asphalt is broken down into these really, really small, like, bubbles. You know, little, little, I mean, we're talking micron-sized little bubbles that can then be sprayed on an aggregate and adhere and, and form an, uh, an asphalt concrete. <laughs> like I said, uh, the big thing to recognize, cutbacks and emulsions, primarily used for cold mix, uh, maintenance applications, hot, uh, hot mix binders used for, for large scale paving operations. Um, like I said, uh, asphalt is a material that is highly, highly dependent, or its, its properties and its behavior is highly dependent on temperature, okay? So let's go back to, to fluid mechanics. Ooh, bringing it back, right? Or bringing it now if you all have fluids right now. <laughs> so what's viscosity? Uh, you all should know this. I mean, it's, first off, it's on the slide, but you all should know this. Viscosity is uh, uh, the measure of a substances or a fluids, if we're talking about uh, 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 asphalt in its fluid state. Uh, viscosity is a uh, uh, measure of resistance to flow, right? Remember that? So, so molasses, does molasses have a high viscosity or a low viscosity? Hi, there we go. Okay, everybody's everybody's remembering this. What's that? That that now there you go. That was a good answer. That was a really good answer. How, how hot is it? That was really good. <coughs> now, the consistency of asphalt is, is I mean, it's it's really uh, dependent on temperature. So, at, at uh, low temperatures, asphalt is very hard. It's very brittle. So at low temperatures, you have high viscosity. On the flip side, if if uh, asphalt is really hot. It gets soft, it gets flowable, uh, and whatnot. So at high temperatures, you have low viscosity. Okay. Now, um, uh, what ends up happening is if you look at uh, so so, let's go back to that. So like I said, you know, low temperature, high viscosity, high temperature, low viscosity. So, so hopefully this this graph sort of it, it makes sense, right? Now, there's an optimum viscosity range. That, that, and basically, the, the big thing is that's dependent on where your, your pavement application uh, is happening. So we're going to have a different optimum viscosity range in, say, West Virginia than we would in, say, Alaska or Miami or, or somewhere like that. So our, our optimum viscosity range is dependent upon our temperature. Now, <coughs> um, when you're, uh, when you're uh, engaged in a paving operation or you're using asphalt, you want to keep your asphalt within that optimum viscosity range. So what that means is you got to keep it within an appropriate temperature. Okay, let me explain. If your uh, asphalt, uh, if it gets, let's say, too cold, okay, during the the, the uh, application process, if it gets too cold, then your asphalt concrete and your asphalt application is going to get too brittle. Okay, and that's going to result in thermal cracking. I'm going to show you a picture of that here in a second, but everybody I think has seen cracking of asphalt before. But if it gets too hot, if the asphalt gets too hot, the viscosity drops too low and it gets too soft, okay? And you get a, a failure called rutting, okay? And, I'm, and you'll see here in a second, I think everybody uh, uh, has seen this before. Does that make sense that you kind of want to keep your asphalt application, I mean, you want to keep it within a certain viscosity range, but that sort of means you want to keep it within a given temperature range as well. See, so what happens is if your asphalt uh, placement gets um, uh, gets too cold, you'll get thermal cracking. How many of you have seen this before? Everybody has seen this before. This is a perfect example of thermal cracking. Okay, and you can see they kind of tried to patch it a little bit. 
Rutting is what happens uh, when your uh, placement gets too hot. The, like I said, the, the pavement, uh, or the asphalt concrete will get too soft and it sort of dips. Okay? And you can see, they're, they're called ruts. You can see these little grooves in the pavement where it sort of just settled out. It didn't maintain that rigid shape enough and it sort of settles out. I'm sure everybody's seen this before as well. Yes? But it, after. After. Once, once it cools down, it cool, what I'm saying here, what I'm saying here, well, Actually, for, for rutting, I would say that's during the application process because it, it's too hot. It's not able to maintain that shape. Thermal cracking uh, probably happens a little over time. But you can, you can tell when thermal crackings happen, it was because it was too cold during the application process. Does that make sense? Well, so you're placing your pavement, and you know how it's being screeded over time? You'd almost have to come back and, and you know, apply that, that screed again. You see what I mean? So that, that might work, but that's usually not done very much because paving, you know, applications, as I'm sure you what they're a very linear process. They don't really go back. So what were you going to say? Um, it's a little bit of this, but it's also a little bit of the fact that it's constrained, okay? What you're talking about is a situation, okay, so let's take thermal cracking, for instance, okay? In, in this instance, we're talking about a road that's a very linear, very linear application, okay? In that linear application, the, the, the road does have room to expand and contract this way. See what I mean? But if you're talking about, let's say, an intersection, there's really no way that it can expand or contract because there's a big road on, on either end sort of preventing it. You see what I mean? So in that small region, you're having these really high stress concentrations, and so it's sort of just giving up in shear is, is what's happening. Yeah, and the only thing it can do, it can't, it can't translate left or right. It can't go down because there's ground, so all it can do is just sort of bubble up. And it kind of, it kind of does it usually. At, at, sometimes at around a 45 degree angle, and then it kind of just ripples. That's a good question, but the short answer is because there's no real room for it to move. That's a good question. Any other stuff? This is good stuff. Okay, <laughs> I I want to talk a little bit about some of the testing uh, of, of asphalt that's done. Um, as you all, I mean, as you all are obviously aware by now, we don't do uh, asphalt testing uh, in our materials lab at Marshall. Um, even if we had the equipment, uh, we, which we don't, I mean, but even if we did, I'd almost be a little hesitant about some of these tests because, I mean, some of these tests, like, like for instance, um, for instance, like this one, flashpoint test, we're literally setting asphalt, bless you, we're literally setting asphalt on fire. Really, really controlled. Fire. No, no. I mean, I mean, this stuff. This stuff is conducted in laboratory settings, so there is something to be said about that. But, but, a lot of these, a lot of these tests involve taking asphalt and subjecting them to very high pressures and temperatures. And as, really hot asphalt can be a little dangerous. So, I, I mean, I'm not saying that 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 we couldn't do it. I'm just saying we have to be really careful. Um, I had a buddy who worked at. Uh, he was a. Um, uh, uh, when I was in, in grad school at WVU, he worked for um, one of the professors who was a big asphalt researcher, and I'd go hang out with him in the asphalt testing lab, and it was always um, really stinky, um, really hot in there, and those specimens, I was you know, like, Whew. you know, be careful. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but um, but yeah, he was a good guy. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the tests. Uh, we'll, we'll keep this pretty short. I just want to give you kind of a, uh, an idea of what's going on. So first off, um, there, the first two, I guess, sort of fundamental tests that are done on asphalt are the rolling thin film oven test and then the pressure uh, aging vessel test. Uh, I didn't mean to put uh, 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 animations on that picture, but I guess I did. Um, the difference between these two tests, well, first off, let's talk about the, the similarities, okay? Both of these tests are meant to simulate uh, aging uh, of, of asphalt. The difference is, is that a rolling thin film test 
uh, is meant to simulate short-term aging. So, you know, the, the, the behavior of, of asphalt literally, you know, while it's being placed you know, at the time of construction. Whereas a pressure vessel uh, is really more for trying to simulate long-term aging of, uh, of asphalt. We're talking like, you know, trying to simulate five years of aging or 10 years of aging. And the idea is um, you're trying to really do two things uh, with these tests. First off, you're trying to determine uh, 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 you know, change in, in loss of, or loss of mass throughout the aging process. So the idea is for this test. So you take a sample of asphalt and you put it in these, these really sort of specialized uh, glass jars. They're, they're kind of like these glass jars. You put them in this oven and what this oven does is it sort of rolls the, uh, the, the cylinders around at a certain temperature and at a certain speed for a certain time. So it's usually around 375 degrees uh, for a little less than an hour and a half. And the idea is by rolling them, you get sort of a new surface of asphalt because it's sort of rolling and it's sort of go going like that. And over time, I mean, we're talking about 375 degrees, you can get a change in mass of the, uh, uh, of the sample of asphalt. Um, you know, so if you've got a, a, diff a certain grade of asphalt, you would do this first off to see if that change in mass is acceptable. It's usually around 1% is, is an acceptable change in mass. Anything less than that uh, is fine. But also, you want to uh, take your sample of asphalt and put it through a simulated aging process and then take that you know, finished sample and then do a shear test, do a bending test, do a tension test, et cetera in order to determine, determine its design properties. I really don't care what this asphalt's uh, properties are as soon as uh, you know, I get the delivery. I care about what its properties are you know, under an application. It's kind of like with concrete. I mean, yeah, we care a little bit about concrete's properties as soon as we're placing it, like slump, air content, but we really need to know uh, uh, concrete's properties you know, after 28 days when it's been hardened and, and we're able to determine compressive strength and modules of rupture, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Okay, so rolling thin film oven, that's for short-term aging. Pressure aging vessel, that's for long-term. So the idea is you have these disks of asphalt and, and then you're putting them under pressure for like 20 hours, uh, for something like 200 degrees Fahrenheit. The, the testing temperature, it, 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 it's not a constant. It depends on what grade of asphalt that, that, uh, that you're looking at. Um, but yeah, we're, we're forcing oxygen into the sample and the idea is to try and simulate a long-term uh, behavior, like five, ten years is kind of the idea. Um, some other tests that are performed, so a flashpoint test, literally you're taking a sample of asphalt, setting a flame to it and seeing how long it takes to catch fire. This is a safety test, okay? This is trying to determine the, the, the temperature at which that asphalt binder can set on fire. So that, that's, that's, that's a safety test, that's not really a capacity test. Um, capacity tests are, are more looking at what is the uh, asphalt binders uh, properties uh, after placement and what are its uh, properties during placement. So a rotational viscometer test, let me, let me explain what a rotational viscometer test. You're basically taking a binder sample, a sample of binder, and, and basically all this is is a, a, a super fancy drill bit. You're taking this drill bit, you're stick, sticking it in the, uh, the sample of asphalt, and you're rotating it, okay? Now this is not water, this is asphalt binder. So it takes a little bit of oomph in order to get that binder spinning, get that spindle spinning, make sense? So the idea is that if you can determine the applied amount of torque required from that motor in order to get that thing to spin, you can determine, maybe oh, I don't know the rotational viscosity, what is the viscosity of, of this binder? Why is that important? Well, it's got to be within a certain uh, uh, tolerable limit in order to be able to pump that binder uh, at the asphalt plant. It'll also help us determine the relationship of that binder between the temperature and the viscosity. That's going to be important for, for placing applications uh, as well. <coughs> Some more mechanical properties. So uh, a shearometer test, that's to, in order to determine uh, its behavior under shear. The idea is we have a... Uh, uh, a, a, a disc of, of, of asphalt binder, we apply a torque. You all should remember from mechanics of deformable bodies, if you take an element, you twist it, it rotates, and you can compare the amount of torque that's applied and the resulting angle of rotation to determine a shear modulus. It's like the elastic modulus, but it's in shear, just trust me. We'll, we'll do it. We'll, we're probably going to do some FE review sessions next year, so we'll, we'll do it. We'll do a deformable one. So, what's that? No, what? 
You're all the way over there, so it won't, it won't pick up on the recording. You should. No, in all seriousness, it, it, it'll show up. It'll show up on the exam. But what's that? Oh. You know, I don't either. <laughs> okay. okay, this one should be uh, uh, a little more familiar. This is a bending beam uh, uh, resistance test or rheometer test. Look, each of these hardened property tests are, are trying to determine an asphalt's response to a given type of loading. So this one's looking at torques and resulting rotations. This one's looking at bending and resulting deformations. Uh, this one's looking at tension, so you're literally casting a tensile specimen of asphalt and yanking on it. Again, they're all trying to determine uh, given properties associated with an asphalt. The reason why I bring all these up, I want you to understand a little bit about uh, asphalt testing, but what I really want you to kind of understand is how we classify asphalt binders. How many of you have heard of these asphalt classifications before, like PG6422 or or PG5228. Has anybody ever heard of these before? Anybody who's done paving? Okay, we got, we got one. Good. All right. Okay. So the most common way of classifying asphalt binders, and this is what I, what I want you to sort of pay attention to for, for celebrations and, and, and at-home assignments, is the naming system. So our current classification system is what's called a PG system. PG stands for performance grade. Okay. Now, we, based on a given performance grade, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, um, performance grade, so if I've got, uh, let's say, performance grade, oh, I don't know, 5228. Based on performance grade 5228, in other words, uh, in order for that asphalt to be classified as 5228, it has to have such a flash point temperature and such a viscosity and such a dynamic shear behavior and such an aging temperature and so on and so forth. And all of those properties are determined based on the tests I just mentioned. So that's, that's one of the big uh, 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 reasons that we do all those tests is to try and classify a given asphalt binder. Now what's going on with the classifications? So if I tell you, uh, if, I, if I ask you what's the deal with a PG, let's say 5228, uh, okay? So those numbers, the 52 and the 28, are referring to the maximum and minimum allowable temperatures that that asphalt can undergo. And those temperatures are measured in Celsius, okay? So for instance, for example, uh, PG5228. PG5228 is rated for a, high, a maximum high temperature of 52 degrees Celsius or 126 degrees Fahrenheit. It's uh, I guess maximum allowable low temperature, I guess minimum uh, allowable temperature is negative 28 degrees Celsius or negative 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So all of these values uh, on the right refer to maximum, you know, the ultimate high temperature it can reach in degrees uh, Celsius. And this is, the, you know, the minimum allowable, the low temperature, the low bar, 28 degrees. Uh, and that's, they're all negative and they're all, and again, they're all measured in Celsius. Now, just so you're curious, the West Virginia DOT, they typically use 6422, okay? Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking, wait a minute, does it ever get a little colder than that or a little hotter than that? Temperatures change. Well, we're going to talk about that here in a second. But just so you are aware where these temperatures are coming from, so minimum temperature is measured at the pavement surface, so that's the worst case scenario there. The maximum temperature is measured three-quarter inches uh, below, just, just so you're aware of that. Now, one thing I do want to mention, asphalt binder grades are always reported in increments of 6 degrees Celsius, okay? So for instance, uh, if you've got PG4634, there will not be a PG4635. So PG4634, the next one's 40. The one after that uh, is 46. So whenever you're selecting, you always err on the side of caution. So round up your high, high, your maximum temperature number, round down your low temperature number. Does, does that make sense? So go down and up. Now, <coughs> your maximum, uh, ju just so you're aware, your maximum temperature is based on a seven day average. The minimum temperature is based on the minimum temperature that's recorded uh, at that site. Now, what's that? Um, yeah, yeah. Now, now, how do you select one? L let me show you how you select one, okay? So, and th this is something I really want everybody to pay attention to, okay? So, 
As I'm sure you're aware, temperature varies, right? The temperature today is going to be different than the temperature tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So um, when we select, when we select um, uh, uh, asphalt binders, we're selecting them not only on recorded temperatures, but on uh, essentially um, uh, our reliability uh, for given measurement. Let, let, let me elaborate on that. Okay, so let's say I've got a site, okay, and I've got some data on that site. So let's say the high temperature is 56 degrees and the low temperature is minus 23 degrees, okay? Let's ignore the statistics and all of this. Let's ignore the statistics. Let's just say a high temperature of 56 and a low temperature of 23. Um, high of 56, low of 23. So I'm going to go back to this slide. High of 56 and a low of 23. Okay? So if that's all I had and I wanted to select a, a, a binder, what I would do is I would round the high up and the, 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 the low, essentially the low down. Okay? So the high, I'm going to round that up to, let's say, 58. And now I'm, I'm, when I say I'm rounding this down, this is actually negative. So I'm going to round that down to 28, and I'm going to use a PG5828 uh, for that site. D does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, what that's not taking into account is statistics. The idea that, you know, on Monday, the temperature's different than it is on Tuesday, than it is on Wednesday, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So these temperatures that I've got recorded uh, for this site, these temperatures are averages. You all should know enough about statistics at this point to know that what, what are some measures of dispersion. We have averages. We have means, medians, modes, right? We also have standard deviations, right? Standard deviations will tell you how much scatter there is in a given data, data set, right? So let's say that I have a uh, high temperature, it's 56 degrees, but let's say my standard deviation is 2, 2 degrees. In other words, the, the, the standard deviations, there's not, as much, uh, there's not as much scatter with the high temperature than there is with the low temperature. So let's say the low temperature is negative 23, but it has a standard deviation of 4 degrees. Okay? Make sense? So what I can then do, what I can then do is I can use those standard deviations to select an asphalt binder based on reliability. Okay? Now, how many of you have had statistics? Okay. Remember Z-scores? Remember Z-scores? So if I have uh, an average, uh, let's say I've got a normal distribution. You may remember, what's your Z-score at zero? Remember that? It's 0.5, right? So if you're selecting an asphalt binder based on nothing but your averages, you only have an asphalt binder that's 50% reliable it, because you are, you're only that much certain. In other words, you're, you're selecting based, think about it like this, if, if the Z-score thing confuses you. You're selecting based on the average temperature, but what if it gets hotter? What if it gets colder, right? So if we can expand that range a little bit to account for some of, those, uh, some of that variability, maybe I can do a little better. Um, a very common um, uh, expansion is instead of ba uh, selecting based off averages, select off your averages, but add two standard deviations on each end. So in other words, I'll, I'll, get, I'll assume worst case scenarios on either end. So let me go back to this. Okay. So my standard deviation for the high temperature is 2 degrees, for the low temperature is 4 degrees. Let's try this again. Let's take the high and let's uh, say that that is 56 degrees, but let's add two standard deviations. And the standard deviation of that was 2. So that comes out to be what? 60. Okay. Now for the low, let's do the same thing. But we're going to subtract to go the other way. So this was minus 23 minus 2 times, and that standard deviation was 4. So um, what was this? This was negative 23, and that's 8, so that's minus 31. Does that make sense? So I propose that using these ranges, what would we pick? We'd pick a PG of what? 64 and minus 34. Okay. Now, 
This one has a little bit of a higher range, right? I propose, and you can go through the math and statistics, if you go based off of two standard deviations, your selection is going to be much more reliable. In fact, you're going to have a selection with a 98% reliability. And that's basically taking your z-scores and saying, well, what if it's two? See what I mean? So if it's one, I can't remember it. I think it's like 80-some percent for, for one standard deviation. I, I can't remember. I, I have to look it up. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let me sort of go here. So if you look at, at these selections right here, so a PG of 5828, that would, that would work, but you would only have a 50% a reliability on that selection. 6434, you'd have a 98% reliability that that asphalt is going to perform under those conditions. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Yes. That's a good question. Um, for, for our purposes, we can easily assume that. But if you wanted to get really refined on, on pavement design and whatnot, that's something you could test is actually collect data and say, well, maybe a different distribution makes sense. And you're, you're starting to actually get into some really funky issues with, with statistics because, you know, how do you determine a usable level of reliability when you have one variable that, you know, is a normal, normally distributed and one variable that's log normally distributed and one that's binomially, you know, distributed and, and so on and so forth. That is really funky. That can get really funky really quick. Um, I actually, I, when I was in grad school, I had a, a graduate course that was just on reliability and it was on how do you, um, ensure system behavior when you have all these different parameters coming in that behave according to different distributions. For, for the structural engineer, it's like what the dead load is normally distributed, but the live load is log normally distributed, or you know, so on and so forth. And how do you assure a uniform level of safety when you've got all these different variables distributed according to different distributions? It, it's kind of interesting. So, how many of you have heard of Monte Carlo? Monte Carlo? Is, is, do you all, do we, do we cover that at all? Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen uh, Monte Carlo simulation, Monte Carlo simulation is really nifty. Basically, you use a computer. See, Monte Carlo simulation is used to to answer problems that are really, really complicated, and and you really can't find a closed form solution. Like you can't find x equals two. It's so so, you know, the problem's so massive that you, you can't really figure it out. Um, what, the way Monte Carlo works is going to, to Mr. Adams' example, if you have different variables uh, assumed according to different distributions, you basically use a computer to generate a bunch of random numbers, take each random number and fit it to one of those distributions, and just count the number of times that uh, you either have a success or a failure. And you can use that to determine your level of, uh, of, of, of safety. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, I got, I, I, we got time, and I, I can't help shake this. Um, Hold on. Let's see if the internet's going to work. Your engineers, I have to show you Monte Carlo simulation. Oh, come on. The internet is being slow today. Is it going to make me use it? Oh, it's going to make me use Edge. Saved my history from last time, though. Let me see. Here we go. Okay, so this is a really perfect example of like where where Monte Carlo simulation would be used in an application that's easy to understand. So, what this is doing, and this is something like you could actually do in Excel really easily. So, what we're doing is we're generating a bunch of random numbers, and for each of those random numbers, we're generating them between zero and one. And we're assuming that each of those numbers represent a point. So we're basically generating a random x value and a random y value. And we're determining based on those, ran, you know, so a random point right here. And then what we do is we determine, okay, does that point, does it lo is it located inside or outside the circle? What you can do is you can count up the number of points that fall outside the circle, the number of points that fall inside the circle, and you can back calculate and solve for what pi is. And you do it. 100 million times and you, you get a, you actually get a pretty good approximation. You go, why would you do that for pi? We know what pi is. 
yeah, you know what pi is. Do you know what the um, reliability of a 30-story structure with, you know, hurricane force winds are? You, you see what I mean? That's a little tougher. Do you know what the reaction of a, you know, is going on inside the CERN collider in Switzerland? You, you know what I mean? They use Monte Carlo for stuff like that because there's so many variables that it, it's so hard to figure out. So they just let a random number generator do the work for them. So. But we do use it in engineering. So. Uh, apparently, we talk about it in some of our classes. I'm happy about that. So. <laughs> Did you use it to determine like whether or not you would pick alternative A or alternative B, or? Do you do a bunch of random numbers? I should have put that a little better. Like I should have, should have. Do you do a bunch of random numbers? No. Do you use Excel to generate random numbers? So. <laughs> See, I'll show you. I'll show you something, real quick. Um, who who here remembers Press Your Luck, the game show? See, what I did when I was selecting groups is is I used the random number generator in Excel. So. The nice thing about Excel is every time you do a new calculation, it, ca it computes another random number. So I put everybody in the class, I put them on a list, right? I generated a random number next to everybody's name, and then I went big money, big money, no whammy, no whammy, no whammy, stop. And then I sorted based on random numbers, and that's how you all got your groups. Like group one, group two, group three. Has nothing to do with asphalt, I know, but. <laughs> I had time. The, yeah, you know, the more you know, the folks on YouTube. All right, um, any questions about asphalt binders? The reason I bring this up is because there is a problem on the homework assignment where you are going to need to specify an asphalt binder based on a reliability and based on temperatures. So, sound good? One, one other thing, let me bring up something on the homework. So, here's the homework assignment. What? If you re relax, I said this is a short assignment. I promise it's a short assignment. What? <laughs> What'd you say? You better have time for it. <laughs> That's all I can say. All right, all right. Okay. Let me let me show you something real quick. So. Um, these bullets are hints. Okay, they're they're supposed to make your life a little easier. There's five problems. There's two prob or there's three problems on wood textbook or problem 10.8 and 10.9 out of the textbook. Um, I'm giving you a specific hint on some of these problems to make your life a little easier. On problem three, problem three is just a board foot problem. So what I'm looking for is the total number of board feet, like add it all up, just one number. So just board feet for here, 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 just add them up. Um, <coughs> uh, and then two problems on asphalt, and I think we've already covered the one today because that's the one we did on, on binders that are on performance grades. Tomorrow we'll talk about asphalt mixed design methodologies, and that's it. That's civil engineering materials. Any questions? We're not there yet. That's tomorrow, or Thursday. All right, all right, guys. That's all I got. I'll see you all on Thursday.